Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan Salva. I'm the chair of the OPM uh, subcommittee for the Amherst uh, School Building Committee. Um, and I will introduce, well, I've just introduced myself and I'll let uh, the other folks from the committee introduce themselves. And then uh, you all may uh, introduce yourselves and, and uh, dig into your presentation. And I'm just going to pick on people the way I see them on the screen. So Anthony, you're you're next after after me. Uh, Anthony Delaney, procurement officer for the town and member of the committee. And then Kathy. I'm Kathy Shane, and I'm chair of the building committee, of which this is a subcommittee, and I'm also on the town council. And Steve. Steve Schreiber, I'm vice chair of the elementary school building committee. I'm a town councilor, and I'm the chair of architecture at UMass. And Dwayne. And I'm Dwayne Chamble. I'm the out of school time coordinator for the district. Okay, appreciate that. I, I, I guess we can go through and introduce my team. Um, my name is Sean Sweeney. I would be the project executive on this project. Um, Tom. I'm Tom Gazunas. I'll be the project director for the project. Brian. Hi, I'm and I'm Brian Wilcox. I'll be the project manager, project representative. Christina. I'm Christina Opper. I'll be your project communications representative. And Del. Uh, Delwyn Williamson, and I am director of cost estimating. So we're excited to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, I believe I, we have a member of our CHA team uh, is going to be presenting the slides. So um, if you're ready, we can jump right in. Yeah, Sean, it's, this is Brian. It seems uh, our, our Chuck is having a bit of a difficulty logging in, so I'm going to open it up and I will present the slides and get us rolling. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. So I will do my best. Here we go. Share screen. All right, great. Can everyone um, see the slides? Uh, we see your presenter's view. Gotcha. Apologies. Um, okay, let me see. There we go. We're still in presenter's view. Oh, we lost it. Go to from beginning. Just hit from beginning all the Whoops. way to the left. Yeah, it's I seem to be struggling with it. Hold on one second. Life was so much easier when we could actually meet in person. <laughs> This is our first, our first test on how we deal with um, issues, right? <laughs> As a team. Yeah. Well, we have a supplement. I will present it as a PDF. I'm not sure why it's running through that way. I will do my best here. Um, Brian, no. it looks like it looks like a second Brian is um, logging in down here. Yeah, Chuck mentioned that he seems to be having an issue. It keeps okay. logging in as me. So uh, I'm everybody just, uh, was that was happening to everybody. He yeah. just needs to change his name. Yeah. Okay, you got it. All right, great. So thanks again. Um, we're very excited to be here. Um, you know, can't wait to get going and talk to you about our expertise and our team and how we can really be a trusted partner with the town of Amherst as they look at this very important project. Um, next slide. So we've introduced our team. Um, today, but what I think what you'll see as we go through this presentation today, that you really have a seasoned a group of professionals, as well as a diverse team um, that can deliver the services uh, that are required for such a project. Um, you'll hear from um, each of the uh, members of the team today that are on the call, talk about um, their expertise and what they bring to the project. Next slide. Thank <laughs> you. 
So a little bit about CHA and why we think that CHA is the perfect fit for the town of Amherst. Um, 30, 30 plus years of managing public uh, building design. So I know from um, introductions today, um, seems like folks do have a good experience in these type of projects and you understand the importance of public procurement, the design process, feasibility, um, as well as managing the construction process. And so we're gonna to touch on those points today, but we feel the strength that CHA brings um, really will provide value to the town. Uh, we'll also hear from Dell later today where we talk about um, cost estimating, uh, value, uh, value management, and how we really try to work with the designers during schematic design and all the way through design completion. And then even post uh, startup construction where we'll help with change orders, change events, and look at to get the best value we can for the town. Um, so, you know, all in all at, at this, during this presentation, we're gonna touch on these points. And at the end, absolutely wanna open it up for uh, questions from the group. Next slide. Tom. Thank you, Sean. So as I said, my name is Tom Gazunas and I will be your project director, uh, working with all of you, town of Amherst uh, building committee and my role is really to provide general oversight and help the team coordinate with all of you and our group to carry us through through all of the various phases of the project. Um, um, we are ready to hit the ground running. When you make your decision later on today to hire CHA, we're on board tomorrow morning. We're ready to go. So we're very excited, as Sean had indicated. And I think as you'll hear throughout our entire presentation. Um, with us, quality really starts at the inception of the project and it's woven into everything that we do. Um, we're going to keep looking and reviewing the design as it comes through from the designers. We're going to look at product selections, code review, uh, of course, cost will be included, but we don't want to deliver a cheap product we want to deliver to you, to the town, uh, an economical project, one that meets all of your needs for the future. Um, Dell will talk about value management in greater detail. Christina will discuss public outreach, again, in greater detail. And now Brian will go into some of the details of the phases as we move through the entire MSBA process. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tom. And again, I'm Brian Wilcox, and I'll be the project manager and project rep representative for Amherst, working on the Fort River, Fort River, Wildwood, Croker, depending upon how this shakes out there in the feasibility study. Uh, I echo what Tom and Sean have said about our excitement, um, our readiness and willingness to engage in this study and in this project moving forward as a responsible uh, partner and extension of Amherst. We see ourselves as as an advocate for the town of Amherst, working with you to um, cross the T's, dot the I's as we move through what is a cumbersome process with MSBA, um, a difficult process in, in working through the public outreach component of this and getting us to a position where we can have a project scope budget agreement um, out the door and moving forward towards detailed design. The first portion of this that we, we address is in that designer selection. Uh, we're here to help you to uh, establish certain of the scope, establish the evaluation criteria, establish what's needed for scoring so that we can get you the best options available for selecting a professional designer who has the experience to meet what you need in Amherst and, and to move us forward on this study uh, for, the, for, for the Fort River Elementary project. In that process, we'll be uh, working with your designer to, you know, to get through the preliminary design program. We'll be looking at existing conditions. We'll be looking at a variety of options that become available to us as we start to work on this project. And we'll be helping you to prep uh, a detailed submission to MSBA, which examines all the available options, examines the budget considerations associated with them, examines uh, a, a ten, a potential alternates that may arise during this process. And we help to get through there and get you to a, a submission that uh, MSBA uh, can be informed about what your needs are, and also to help us get to a position where the town, uh, the town council, uh, the school building authority can help to understand what would be your preferred 
schematic report, what would be your preferred direction on this project? The option that works best, that is most responsible for Amherst. Uh, and we are there to provide that, uh, that leadership as your extension of it. During the schematic phase, once we're moving forward and we've established what exactly uh, we're gonna be building here, we'll work diligently with the architects and engineers uh, to ensure that we keep on target with scope, quality, and budget, so that when we do submit that project scope and budget agreement at the end of this, that we are in a great position, that Amherst is in a position to make sure that the expectations have been set, the tone and pacing of the remainder of the project through construction is also established, and that we identify any risks that may uh, potentially occur to us throughout the project, and we work to mitigate those risks. And while you know I act as the the day to day, uh, the detail oriented guy who communicates with all the other key stakeholders and leaders who are working to execute this uh, this effort through the feasibility study on behalf of Amherst and for the Fort River project, but. You know, that's only a part of it. Uh, we also recognize that um, speaking to your community, uh, the public outreach component of this is incredibly critical to making sure that an informed community can um, allow your council to make those informed decisions. So I lay heavily on Christina, who is our communication specialist, and I'd like to hear from her a little bit about her approach. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so again, I'm Christina. Uh, I've been with the company for almost 18 years now. I'm a project manager and I have a marketing background as well. And so I will be your uh, dedicated project communications representative. I'll work with uh, you, the school building committee, as well as the town of Amherst, school district, uh, local organizations to try to get the word out to your community early and often. Um, it's really important to engage the community right away in the process, let them know what's happening um, keep them informed step by step throughout the process. Um, and the more information they have, uh, the less questions I think there'll be when it comes time to actually approve the project. Um, it's helpful for the school building committee to have that kind of feedback. So I'll help you uh, gain that feedback, gather that feedback through a variety of mediums. So I usually come in uh, in the beginning and, and help you create kind of a strategy or a plan for outreach. We'll identify uh, how your community receives information, um, whether it's digitally, uh, by print, by face-to-face -face meetings, by local organizations. Um, and we'll highlight all of those and figure out our plan to get out to the communities. Even as soon as getting the designer on board, we're gonna start uh, wanting to meet with the community. During this time where we can't meet face to face, it's a little bit more difficult, but I've become much better with uh, hosting Zoom meetings and, and doing online polls. And, and I, I have a history of doing um, online surveys as well as print surveys and, and workshops in both a digital and in-person format. Uh, I will build you a project website because it's really important to have that singular place where everybody can find the information, the most up-to-date information, instead of having to go out over and over again and trying to say the same thing over and over again. One place where everybody can go and get the most information, the most up-to-date information. Um, I can help you create print communications and digital communications, newsletters, informational brochures, as well as um, we can work on video series and, uh, and online presentations and live stream presentations. The good thing about uh, the pandemic is there is an opportunity to, to reach a greater audience um, through digital mediums, um, people that aren't always available to attend a meeting in person, uh, whether that's schedule based or mobility based or whatever the issues are, um, we will explore all different options uh, to get out to your community. So I will help you lead that uh, effort from the get-go and I will walk you through every single phase. Uh, I've done a lot of MSBA schools and I work closely with the MSBA um, on each phase of the project um, to make sure that they're looped in as well. It's important that they stay involved and they stay abreast of everything that's going on with the project as well. They really appreciate um, being linked in uh, through that process. And uh, I will help you walk this process all the way through to construction completion, close out and your ribbon cutting ceremony. And I think that um, 
Brian's going to give us a little bit more information about some of our other team players as well. Yeah, thank you, Christina. And I think it's also important to, to realize what Christina just mentioned there in the end, that this is, uh, while we are focused on this as a feasibility study right now, we understand that project life cycle and getting to the tail end of this is really the larger, the larger picture for us, understanding that getting you into either a new building, a renovated building, multiple renovated structures is the key outcome here. And while we do laser focus in and, and we do kind of narrow in on the feasibility study portion of this, it is important to think of the long range goal. And we we actually see that there's some exciting, we're, we're, we're excited about this opportunity to also explore working with some of our WMBE partners that we have good relationships with throughout the region, especially in Massachusetts. We've done a lot of work as an organization and working through utilization goals and engaging uh, local partners um, or even just regional partners who are qualified M and W firms or D or, or DBE firms as well. And we look forward to this exciting opportunity. We've actually had some already engaging calls. Uh, we actually see this as a real opportunity for us as we get later into detailed design and through the construction phase. Um, internally, we have some exciting people. Alicia Monks is a registered architect. She's LEED certified. She has net zero experience. And she comes with a, an incredible background in doing design review, constructability review, and really QA, QC documents as we move forward. Uh, she will have an eye on things as we go through that feasibility study. But you know, as part of this process that Tom mentioned, um, and that I know uh, Dell will also get into, is this idea of managing quality from the get-go so that we are always keeping our scope, schedule, and budget in line, you know, uh, just traditional values and project management. Uh, we think highly of schedule. Uh, I'm a big proponent of having solid schedules, good milestones, and a lot of traceability between uh, account and traceability and accountability. And we've partnered with Dynamic Scheduling Solutions and Heather Buenicki, who comes with uh, 20 years experience in Massachusetts, providing state work, doing high level scheduling uh, in order for us to be able to manage this now all the way up through uh, in, in turning us over to a contractor or a CM and being able to do those reviews. She's got a great experience in managing impacts and claims and very excited to have her as part of our team. Um, and um, I, you know, we think VE, we think VM, and I don't really wanna to get too much into talking about that, but we have a great, a great department in CHA and a lot of experience doing this to help make sure you get the best value for your project. And I'm gonna turn it over to Delta to share about that. Del, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, thanks, Brian. Um, that, that pause just gave you a moment to see the graphic. Um, it, it's a very simple graphic representing where our service adds value to the entire life of your Fort River Elementary School project. Firstly, early benchmarking during the feasibility design stage uh, that Christina mentioned earlier about um, early and often. This particular approach applies equally to cost estimating, as you can see in, in this graph here. Secondly, we engage during the design phase as another set of eyes on the design package. This is a collaborative process uh, with Alicia's constructability review. Um, Brian mentioned uh, that service earlier. And, and then lastly, during the actual construction phase, we are supporting our project managers with cost analysis and change order review. As a current example, our Lincoln School is currently under construction. This is a challenging renovation and addition that our cost estimating team has been engaged with from early feasibility to now. Earlier, Brian mentioned scope, scheduling, and budgeting, which is where we pride ourselves, and it's a, a matter close to my heart. One of our tools in this is the value engineering. Um, value engineering is better represented by our efforts to value manage, which, by the way, does not compromise quality. It's all about dollars. Rather than the value management process, excuse me, um, the value management process makes your construction dollars 
go as far as possible. Our goal is to provide, provide the most cost, the best, excuse me, I'll start that sentence again. Our goal is to provide the best cost data available so the, this building committee can make the most informed decisions. Handing it back to you, Sean. Thanks, Del. Um, so a lot to unpack there, right? Um, and I know we're gonna move on to um, some of the questions that you asked earlier, and we're gonna give time for you to access questions as well, because we can dive into this a lot more. But at the end of the day, why is CHA the right choice for Amherst? And what we truly believe, and hopefully you're beginning to see as we talk about our team and our approach, that we deliver certainty. Uh, we've been doing it for over 30 years in Massachusetts on public buildings. We've worked with most architectural teams and construction teams in the area. We understand the market. We understand the pressures on the market, whether it be with subcontractors, labor forces, or even uh, materials. But we also understand the feasibility, which of course is the first part. And as Christina mentioned, Brian mentioned, Tom and Dell, it's really a team effort, right? We all bring um, our abilities to that effort to help the town of Amherst as a really, a, not just a OPM firm, but truly as a trusted advisor. Because at the end of the day, we know the committee, we know the council wants to do the best thing for the town. And we, and we really want to be that trusted advisor to make that happen. So if we may, um, this uh, wraps up kind of the 15 minute presentation as outlined. Um, we've taken the liberty to uh, put the qu five questions that you've asked. And if we can, we'd like to start there and make sure we answer those questions. And I'm sure if you have other questions um, after that, we can uh, move forward with those. So if I may, um, Tom, do you want to take question one? Sure. You asked about a challenging elementary school. So I'm going to uh, describe the richer elementary school project and the process that we went through with that. So the richer school, City of Marlboro, started very, very much in the exact same place you are, looking at the schools, looking at the district, looking at where things are at for you, your design enrollment, uh, your student population. Uh, through our process, and we looked at many, many sites across the city, it was determined that what the city really needed was to build a new school, uh, one in addition to the three that the district already had. This helped to solve their overall district overcrowding problems. Uh, but of course, you can imagine the challenges that that ensued because we went from, okay, we're going to either be building a new school or renovating the existing richer. Um, and in that neighborhood, uh, all of the schools in Marlboro are district neighborhood schools to then communicating with the community that we're now going to build a brand new school on a different site. Um, after a lot of public participation and public information, the city and the city council overwhelmingly, it was a unanimous vote at the city council to approve the project and move it forward. A uh, little other interesting fun fact here on the, what was then the richer and is now the good now elementary school. Through our design and feasibility study, the city determined that they wanted to look at and then ultimately pursue a model school. At the end of the day, the Goodnow School came in at $10 million under the original feasibility budget and was delivered a month ahead of schedule. Uh, that ended up providing a huge benefit to the city as a result, not as a result of, but in the wake of the COVID pandemic because it having the new school with new classrooms allowed for the social distancing aspects that were needed. Um, and the younger grades in Marlboro were actually always in a remote school setting. There was a very, very short window, really only the time that it was mandated by the state that everyone be 100% remote. Uh, the city was able to engage in a, in a hybrid model um, very, very early on. So 
long story up there, but really it, it one that started out as a huge challenge and ultimately resulted in a huge benefit for the city. Great. Uh, Tom, can you uh, take a question too as well? Sure. Net zero uh, and net zero schools. So I'm also involved in the Belmont High School project, uh, large project, seven through 12 school, but it is entirely fossil fuel free. <laughs> the only external power to the building is electricity. Um, we have 304 500 foot deep geothermal wells that are supplying all of the heating and all of the cooling to the building. Um, as Dell had, and we all spoke about value management, um, there was a lot of effort, energy, not to use the pun energy, but a lot of time was spent on reviewing not only the upfront costs, because of course, when you go with something like a geothermal, um, very, I shouldn't say very, but higher upfront costs. But overall, when you look at the life cycle costs of the buildings, because let's face it, our schools are being built for 50 years minimum, uh, those life cycle costs outweigh that upfront cost and there's an overall savings to the community. Uh, the entire building will have PV panels on the roof. And you know, I, I also wanna just say that Net zero lead, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they were like the buzz thing, the, the, the nice to have and kind of a, but they're really now uh, built intrinsically into every school project. And as a soon to be new granddad for the first time, it has really, you know, put a different focus in my life and in thinking about what we're doing for our children and now for me, and hopefully some of you, if not all of you um, in your futures, our grandchildren and really setting the, the, the tone and forward thinking for what we're doing. So uh, roundabout story here, but lead energy efficiency, net zero, they're all aspects that need to be woven into every project as we move forward. And you can see from the list that I'm not gonna read the names, but the two lists that are on the slide in front of you, the extensive experience that we have um, in lead, in net zero, in chips, um, and, and moving those projects forward. Um, we're very proud of that fact, and we will continue to do so uh, in all aspects moving forward. So. Great, thanks, Tom. Yep. Uh, question three, Christina. Uh, your third question, I think, was um, about generally engaging the broader community, challenges, successes, failures. So one of the examples I, I chose to share is the Nosset Regional High School project, which we're proud to say uh, just passed uh, their ballot vote um, on March 30th. Uh, this was a complicated project to get out to the community. Um, the Outer Cape uh, is, is a very interesting set of communities out there as far as how they get their information. Plus this was a regional district, which meant it was four regional towns within the official district, as well as two additional towns that were not officially part of the district. And uh, it's a, a highly attended uh, school choice school uh, on, on the Cape. So there was kind of this broad uh, outreach to reach both the district as well as the greater community that this particular school serves. Um, the second challenge on this particular project is that we had to do it through COVID. So we started the project pre-COVID. Um, there are some nice pictures there about uh, with some um, visioning workshops that we had with the public uh, prior to COVID. We did as many in-person fa in face-to-face meetings as possible, let people get a sense of what the building looked like, what its challenges were, what the educational plan meant, and uh, what our options looked like. Post-COVID, our meetings were all virtual. Um, our outreach was entirely virtual. Um, but we were successful in reaching the community through Zoom meetings, um, 
through small forums, through print, through um, digital um, print media, um, as well as uh, streaming videos, live streams of interviews uh, and, and presentations. So we did really did use that kind of com combined effort, which honestly, I think one of the, the lessons that I learned as a communicator through the pandemic is, as I mentioned before, it actually gives us more opportunity to reach a greater number of the public by using all of these different avenues. Um, and so NASET was uh, an interesting challenge and a success. Um, and, uh, and we're happy to be moving into the, the detailed design phase with them and moving forward with their project, which is, I believe, slated to complete in 2025. Um, I believe your next question had to do with uh, projects that that didn't proceed, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dina. Um, so I can answer the first one pretty easily. Um, CHA has never been terminated from a project in its history. Uh, we've always seen all our projects um, go from the beginning to the end, um, but we have had some projects not move forward. So, Christina. So the example that we're choosing to to share with you today is Tisbury. Um, Tisbury is a beautiful community out on Martha's Vineyard, um, also known as Vineyard Haven. Um, they were invited into the MSBA program in uh, 2014, I believe it was. We joined them in 2016 as their OPM, uh, completed a feasibility study. And in 2018, we unfortunately did not get the project passed at the ballot. Um, so the story behind that is that um, we worked diligently with the town, the school committee, and the school building committee, committee to engage the community and get information out to them. There's a, a little rendering of what that new building would have looked like on the upper left. And what's below it is I did several surveys for this town when we were going through that initial fe feasibility study. And their two main options were to build new on the existing site or add, renovate, add. And you can see it was a 50-50 split as far as whether they wanted to keep the building or replace the building. And continually educating the community, we still felt that it was a 50-50 split on, on the main two options. Um, the building committee did as much as they could and me along with them to inform the public on why they were choosing new construction. Ultimately, it was more efficient. It was a shorter project and it was slightly less expensive. Um, but Though we passed the project overwhelmingly at town meeting, at the town ballot, we lost by 21 votes. So it was, the result was exactly as the community had spoken to us through those two years. It was a 50-50 split. Um, what did happen with the town of Tisbury is they uh, removed themselves from the MSBA program and restarted the project and we were um, both um, grateful and honored to be invited back to serve as their OPM for a non-MSBA funded renovation and addition study, uh, which we have uh, recently completed and um, we're preparing for it to go back to the ballot uh, this, this late spring, early summer. Um, so the, the image on the upper right is us uh, adhering to their desire to save the original 1929 building on the front, um, renovate and expand the remainder of the building. Um, and we're, we're doing the same thing uh, now going back out to the community. And honestly, we're getting a lot of very positive feedback on our efforts to save the original building. So it wasn't really, um, uh, an insight into any kind of failure on, on the part of the town or the school committee or the school building committee it really was just um, a, a minor understanding of, of, of what was a, a real priority to the community and, and really trying to sell the effort um, as to how it was going to benefit the community as a whole. Um, but this project is moving forward well and, uh, and it's actually a good lesson that we learned to, to spend more time getting feedback and more time 
educating uh, the public on what the project means and, and what it costs and how it's going to come about and how it's going to benefit the community in the long run. Great. Thanks, Christina. Um, and I think your last question, um, we're going to ask Tom to speak to that. Sure. Thank you. So we approach all of our projects in a spirit of collaboration. Gone are the days of that antagonistic contractor, owner, architect, and we fight each other. Um, the projects don't proceed well that way, and we have never taken that approach. Um, I like to think of every project as a three-legged stool. One leg is the owner, that includes us as your OPM, and of course the MSBA um, having that role. The other leg is the designer, the architect, and all of their design team. And the third leg is the contractor. If you take out any one of those legs in the stool, then everybody falls and everybody gets hurt. Our approach is to keep that stool together with all three legs and nice and strong and have all of the groups work together collaboratively to make the best project for the town of Amherst, the, our students and faculty as we move forward. That's not to say that we won't be a very strong advocate and make sure that the town gets what it deserves out of this process and out of the project. Um, that's why we include our uh, estimating team all along so that we can do that deep dive value management and make sure that when those change orders, and we all know that there will be some change orders that will come through, but when those change orders come through, they are fair, fair to all three parties, because that's really what makes a project run right. And, you know, my style and our style, Brian's style, who will be on the project every day with all of you and all of us together, is again, to work collaboratively to get the project done um, in the best interest of the town of Amherst. Thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. And one thing, if I could add to what Tom just said um, on working on projects, you know, it's 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 a little nuanced, but it's a real value. As we work on, you know, we work on a number of school projects as well as municipal projects, and we truly work together as a team. And and what that means to Amherst is, we'll see things happening on one particular project, whether it be in feasibility or design or actual construction, and then say, whoa, this kind of shocked everybody, and. In our internal meetings, we'll say, and Tom might laugh when I use this one example, we just put epoxy flooring on a school mm -hmm. and the, the um, <clears throat> uh, maintenance personnel wanted less, it less gritty. And so we had to reapply this floor four or five times. And don't we go to another project and they're preparing to do epoxy flooring. So we said, hey, first and foremost, we should do a test pass. We should make sure not only that you know, the school representative is happy, but bring out the maintenance staff, make sure they're happy with this finish and make sure it's something that they feel they can maintain. And so these stories are happening every day um, within CHA. And I think, you know, as a team, we can definitely bring that value throughout all phases um, of this journey. So I just wanted to throw that in there, Tom, because as you were talking, I was thinking it's not just managing the team, but it's bringing that collective experience and whether it be experience from 20 years ago, whether it be from experience from the last week, um, we really feel we can help the town of Amherst. Absolutely, so, that's great. So we've answered those five questions. I'd love to open it up to um, the committee to um, ask any of us um, any questions or you want us to dive into anything in detail. Steve? Uh, thank you so much, uh, fascinating. So I do have a question about question number four. So number four is supposed to be my question, but the... Um, so you answered for the firm, CHA, but in, I assume that goes all the way back to the origins. How about individually? So we were also asking about individually if, whether or not that um, any of you individually as a person in charge, as an OPM, has there been uh, any termination? Not for me. I can say no. I've never been terminated. I have never been terminated. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. I just want to make sure that part was covered also. All right, great, thank you. In full disclosure, I 
was not reappointed as commissioner when in my previous life as the public safety commissioner for the Commonwealth, but that was a change in governors. I have kind of a follow up on, on question one, which is uh, not, not usually the one I ask when we ask them uh, individually. Um, it's just, it, you answered uh, for a challenging project. Um, I guess I, I'd be curious what you see as potential challenges for us with this project um, in, in what you've seen from what we've given you, um, what, what do you think is our greatest challenge? Uh, Brian, do you want to start with that? Sure, I'd be glad to, and I, I appreciate that that question. Uh, you know, I think in just discussions that um, that we've had during the uh, the kind of the pre-proposal walkthrough, it was clear that one of the biggest challenges you're going to run into, or it appears that you may run into, is dealing with the with the public in the community in terms of establishing exactly what it is you need to be successful in terms of the three potential schools, the elementary schools that are, are being looked at, which is yes, it's the Fort River project, but also incorporating uh, enrollment in from Wildwood and Croker into how you manage this process. So I think engaging the community um, early, making sure that we can uh, manage and set expectations uh, is a good way for us to speak to a little bit about what Christina had mentioned during this process about getting to a point where there's a split in the community or a potential not to approach um, the idea of a new fancy building, a new building with steam, uh, a new steam programs, a nice new fancy structure where the community itself may feel um, a real connection to these schools. And while they may be older, how do we look at incorporating the community's view into this project so that in a long run, we can get you um, what you need for the next 50 years in terms of managing your enrollment and managing your programs, but also upgrading you um, in a way that's efficient. So I think that's gonna be what I see as the biggest challenge is managing expectations at the community level by doing that engagement um, and, and moving forward through this process. And I say that a little bit because for me, I, you guys have been through this before. You've been through the MSBA process, you've had this experience. I think the you understand what to expect in terms of milestones, but I think that it's gonna be that community outreach, engaging a, a designer who's very familiar with this type of work and the elementary school and making sure we get you what you, what you need. But that's, that's listening, that's communications. And again, that's setting the expectations. And if I could jump in too on that uh, point, Tom and I are actually working with a district right now uh, in the Commonwealth that is looking at one of their elementary schools, which is a community school and they have I think it's for a community elementary school spread across the town. And the solutions that they're considering um, include a, a, a new school building on a different site with possible redistricting throughout the district and, and shifting things around. And, and so we're familiar with this process. This is not the, the first time we had to do it. Tom had to do it in Marlboro. We're doing it for another community. And we understand that that's, a, that's difficult to go through with a community to keep them in, informed, engaged, involved, and, and feel part of that process um, when, you're, when you ultimately have to make decisions that's best for the district and best for the town itself. Um, but, but that is important. I agree with you, Brian, that, um, that you know, that I think that challenging piece of getting out to the public and informing them is a challenge for all districts, all communities across the Commonwealth. And it's sometimes their greatest challenge because ultimately you need buy-in from the community. You need parents' support. You need um, your senior citizens' support. You need all of the support. This isn't just a school for the students that are going there now. It's students that are gonna be there in 30 years. It's um, you know, people that own property in town, it's a town asset. Um, and, and we'll make sure that we, we craft that message and explain that piece to all of your project stakeholders. Um, Tom, I don't know if you wanna jump in at all on the, on the uh, redistricting efforts that we're doing in another town. I, I have to apologize to the, to the team. I have an emergency I have to deal with. So I'm gonna put myself on mute but I'll keep listening, but I have to deal with something. Right, thank you. So yeah, I think biggest message we can say 
regarding the redistricting is informing the community, informing the community as early as possible, as soon as you start to head in the direction and knowing where you're going with that redistricting, if it's necessary, that that information gets out. Because what we've seen is that it, the, we don't want the redistricting to, or the new project, let me put it that way, the new project to give the impression that it is causing the redistricting if it is not. In most cases, what we found is that redistricting is required regardless of where the new building, if it is a new building, would be located. And that message needs to get conveyed early and often because it gets lost. Okay. Great, thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a little bit more time. I don't know if there's other uh, questions, Kathy. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if any of the projects you've had, you've had to work with choices on, are you building a smaller school in terms of student size or a larger school where the um, intimacy of the school was an issue in the community? I, I don't know whether that was clear, you know, that on, you know, no, do you, I, uh, okay. I understand exactly. Um, and that was one of the very, very strong factors in Marlboro, because in order to, again, alleviate the uh, overcrowding issue that they had, the one option was to create a very large elementary school. And the, <clears throat> the superintendent, the principals, um, the, the district, the mayor, all determined that they did not want an elementary school that was mirroring or actually even larger than their middle school. So that was one of the definite factors in determining that it was better to build a fourth school than it was to renovate and expand at the existing richer school. Thank you. Did that answer your um, question, Kathy, I hope? I might also jump in here and, and cite the, the Bridgewater Elementary School project that we're working on that's under construction right now. They did an analysis on the enrollment. Um, the MSBA had given them two certified enrollments for a pre-K to two and a pre-K to three. They're a larger community. Um, and they were also uh, dealing with the same problem. They have a lot of kids. They have a single elementary school, but they wanted that small school feel. And um, we did the study with the different enrollments to, to figure out what was gonna work best for the community, as well as spreading the grades across all of the schools within the district um, properly for, for parity um, to all the students. And they went with a pre-K to two and the design, although it's a school that's built for 750 kids because of the enrollment in the town, um, the design included uh, essentially pods, um, scaled down areas, to make it feel like more of smaller community spaces within a larger school, while also being thoughtful about access to shared services, the gymnasium, the cafeteria, and all of that, as well as um, access to the community spaces for after hours. Um, so it, it's definitely, I think, a challenge that, that um, many districts have when they're trying to create that small school feel. This particular district, there, the building that they replaced used to be three small houses in a single building and they wanted to kind of recreate that that small school feel in the newer building and and we're we're helping them, them achieve that thank you any last questions oh. great well thank you very much that was very informative anthony did you have uh, some housekeeping uh, if uh, you could send me the slides, just for our yes. record, uh, after this meeting, just email those to me. Uh, this recording will be put up on the town's YouTube channel in time, and uh, we'll see the committee for the next interview in 10 minutes. Great. Yeah. Anthony, we log out of this, right, and log back into the next. Yes, it's a totally different Zoom room, so you know, you'll have to log.
Brian, did you have something to say before we? we yeah, I, I was going to ask you guys one question. Maybe somebody can pick up on it. It's just a, we know that you've been through this experience before with MSBA. We assume you had an OPM and I, I don't need to know the, the firm's name, but I'm just curious what you thought of that experience. And if you had kind of one thing that that firm could have changed from your perspective, not to get this through in the past, but what could they have done a little bit differently to have met some of your expectations? That's that's a somewhat hard question to answer, as most of the folks on this committee weren't actually on that prior committee. Gotcha. Um, and and while most of us were here in town, um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that I have a good answer off the top of my head. You know, it, it was it's a, it's sort of a different time and place, and uh, and sometimes communities need to learn by doing. <laughs> Okay, well, I appreciate that. And thanks so much for the time. We're really yep. excited for the opportunity. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.